Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Um, thank you all for an awesome 2023 uh, series. Uh, we did meet the 10,000 subscriber uh, mark, so thanks for getting us there. Um, thanks for all of you who've been a part of it and watched all of them and just hang out with us every Friday. We enjoy it and uh, we appreciate your support on all of this. If you like what you see here on the What's Up webcast, please go ahead and subscribe and leave a like on a video. Um, and all these are generally live episodes and at the end uh, they are uh, then saved onto YouTube. So you can go back and watch these at any time that you want. Uh, we do hope you had a good holiday uh, break. Uh, I know we were quite busy. Uh, one little announcement, a uh, month from now, this whole studio is going to change. We're shifting to a new studio. So um, you'll notice that the background and stuff is going to change probably in the next month or so. Um, so about a month from now, we'll have a new studio that these will be taking place in. So it should be kind of cool. Um, but yeah, other than that, let's get started. So it's uh, January and that means there's some new stuff uh, that we're going to be talking about. Uh, Totem is the big one. Uh, we've got some cool surprises that involve Totem. And uh, we'll be talking about that here shortly at the end of the episode. Uh, there was a question up there I noticed that got deleted about putting a CQ350 head as a kit with an EQ6 tripod. I figured I'd address that. Um, the CQ350 is too big to put on an EQ6 tripod. It just is not a secure setup and won't let you maximize the full potential of an EQ or a CQ350's payload. That's why it's on a bigger tripod. So I'm uh, sorry, but there's no kit that we're gonna make with a CQ350 and an EQ6 tripod. It just they don't match well together. So you can either get that put it on a pier, or you can put it on the big uh, tripod it comes with, or an EQ8 pier if you need something heavier. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Like I said, if you like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. Um, if you have an idea for episodes, uh, email us at info at skywatchusa.com and title it What's Up, and uh, we'll get that on there. If you want to stay tuned with what's going on, head over to skywatchusa.com, head up to the top, click subscribe and save, and you can be on our email list, and that'll keep you up to date with what's going on there. So... All right, so brightest thing in the nighttime sky, of course, is the moon. And our new moon for the month is actually right around the corner. January 11th um, is the new moon. And that actually lands right in the middle of the week. Uh, so we have two dark sky weekends. We have the 9th and the 10th, which is coming up pretty quick. And then the following weekend, uh, we have a very thin little crescent moon early in the evening that'll set. And that's the 13th, 14th. So... Uh, there are two dark sky weekends that you can get out and do some cool viewing. It's going to be cold, so uh, please dress warmly. And make sure you have all the proper equipment uh, for being out in the cold as well. Now, full moon is January 25th, uh, so at the end of the month. And this is known as the wolf moon, and it's named for the wolves that are usually active this time of year. Um, a lot of this is in the uh, eastern region of the U.S. is where a lot of this originated from. Um, kind of in the colonies, and uh, there's a lot of Native American folklore behind the full moon names as well. And um, you can go to Farmer's Almanac uh, on online and learn all about the history and the names. And there's multiple names per full moon, so you can go ahead and check that out too and learn the folklore. It's an awesome thing to actually have. If you do a lot of outreach events, it's a cool little uh, piece of information that makes it kind of cool to talk about the full moon. All right, let's talk planets. Whoop, going too fast. A little rusty today. All right, so planets. Um, so we're going to bring up Stellarium. Stellarium is a free software that you can get for pretty much any device, and you can do telescope control with it as well um, and do all that fun stuff. So right now we're looking at about 7 o'clock uh, this evening. So Saturn's getting kind of towards the end of its uh, presence in the nighttime sky. Uh, for the season right now, uh, but it's still easily visible out there in the southwest. Um, but by, you know, about nine o'clock, Saturn's gone at this point. So by the end of the month, let's fast forward there. 
by the end of the month, Saturn will basically be exiting the nighttime sky, unfortunately. We had a good run this year, but the rings are actually closing up on Saturn too. So as it inches into next year, it'll get more edge on. Um, and it's going to make for some cool viewing. But for now, in the next couple weeks, you'll still be able to catch Saturn in the early um, twilight hours in the evening um but by the end of the month it'll essentially be gone by the time it gets dark so um but it's been good uh beyond that moving up the chain we do have neptune neptune's still hanging out right about there um so that it's still visible neptune's a little difficult to see it's rather small because it's far away and it's a dark blue so it it easily blends a little bit more into the background um, than say some of the brighter planets do, but it's still a fun one to see, but some aperture is going to be helpful, uh, to resolve that sphere of the planet. So it's kind of a tough one to catch. It's not one of my favorite planets to view just cause there's not a lot to it. Um, but that is visible right now. Um, it's about seven. So it's just under, oh, 7.8 magnitude. So technically it's just outside the naked eye visible capabilities. Um, but that is uh, Neptune still hanging out up there as well. Now, as we kind of progress on, uh, we have Jupiter hanging out nice and bright, uh, high overhead uh, in the south just after sunset. It is easy to catch. And we'll have that for the next probably couple months. Um, probably towards the end of February is when we'll have uh, Jupiter exiting. Most of the planets right now, in the northern hemisphere just from orbits and their positions and stuff like that are mostly visible in the fall winter time frame obviously as the years go by they'll they'll move more but right now they are mostly positioned in the the autumn winter and probably early spring uh time is when most of the planets are currently visible over the next few years um so we have jupiter hanging out nice and bright Always a good one to go out and view. It's a good outreach uh, target as well. And not too far from that is the planet Uranus. Uh, Uranus is a fun one to view. Um, it sits halfway between Jupiter and the Pleiades right now, so it's not terribly difficult to find. Um, but Uranus is cool because it's closer than Neptune is, and it's easier to actually see that it is a sphere um, against the stars, and it looks more like a planet. Um, so I actually like to show that one during events besides the fact that everyone cracks jokes about it. And if you ever want to get around that at your event, you get a jar that says the Uranus jar jokes uh, or Uranus jar. And for every time someone cracks a joke, you put a dollar in it and you'll be amazed what kind of telescope you can get after just a few events because you just crowdfunded your telescope off of stupid jokes. So that's one way to do it. So, uh, but you do have Uranus up there that's hanging out um, as well. And that's pretty much it for the planets. Uh, we should be getting Mars back um, later this year. Uh, Mars is every other year uh, from how the orbits work. So this will be a Mars year or a Martian year. Um, it won't be incredibly well positioned um, as it was a couple years ago, but It'll be up and we'll, it'll be visible towards the end of 2024. Um, but for now, uh, it's just the typical planets, you know, Saturn, Neptune, Jupiter, Uranus um, are all visible uh, right now. But we will start losing Saturn at the end of the month, probably towards March, end of February, March. Jupiter will start to, to exit uh, the nighttime sky as well. Um, so that's it for the planets right there. So something... Go out, check it out while you still got time. Now the sun. Uh, so this year, 2024, is the total solar eclipse here in um, the U.S. and Canada. And it's a big deal. And right now, I would recommend that if you do not have plans already, that you get your act together at this point. Because um, April 8th is about three months away at this point so it's it's gonna get crazy really quickly um and places are very expensive a lot of places are the prices are just hiked to incredible amounts of money for what they are um but i would really 
ask that you do not wait any longer if you do not have your stuff together, whether that's a place to stay, whether you need solar filters, because now that we're through the holidays and as we inch, especially as we get closer into March, people are going to go crazy for solar filters. And I know the annular eclipse that we had in October was crazy. Totals are even bigger. So do not wait. And the one thing about a total solar eclipse, particularly if you're going to be in totality, you have no need for the high-end filters like hydrogen alpha and calcium because you're going to totality. You're on the path of totality and you need a white light filter to be able to do that. Um, and you won't have it because when you're shooting totality, you're actually removing the filter only if you're in totality. And we're going to have a few videos leading up to the eclipse that talks about that a little bit more. Um, you will probably see a lot of episodes about the sun as we head into April at this point. That way we're just really well equipped and set up for the eclipse. But April 8th is right around the corner. If you do not have your plans together, I would not wait any longer. So it's going to get crazy. Uh, but the sun's still hanging out up there. It's been had some good activity. We have some major uh, flares that have occurred lately as well. So if you're in uh, more northern or southern latitudes, um, there are uh, auroras that could be taking place here soon. Um, but if you ever want to see what's going on in hydrogen alpha, you can go over to Gong. Uh, I just type in Gong, G-O-N-G-H alpha into Google, and it pops up the page. And these are all professional solar observatories. They're all over the world. So there's usually a live image of the sun uh, in hydrogen pretty frequently. But there's some nice filaments there, some nice active regions, some good prominences. It's fairly quiet right now. But as we move into 2025, which is maximum, solar maximums 2025, the activity is going to continue to go up. So if you have a hydrogen alpha telescope, awesome. Um, and it has to be a hydrogen alpha solar telescope. Don't be using imaging H alpha filters. They are not the same. Um, but there's some cool stuff going on the sun. It changes every day. Um, but yeah, this is going to be the year of the sun uh, for the eclipses. So. Let's see, meteor showers. Um, there's actually a meteor shower going on right now. It's the Quadrinids. Um, this peaked, it's already gone past the peak, January 3rd and 4th. Um, the moon's been a little bit bright, so it's not ideal uh, for watching a meteor shower from dark sky sites because you have a large bright moon that's visible and it's kind of washing out the best time to go view um, at that point. So... This wasn't an ideal year for the quadrants, but it's still it's still a thing. So get out there, check it out if you can. So comets. Um, now there are, there's some comets hanging out there. There's one. Where's my web page? Is that here? We go. Um, you can go over to cometchasing.skyhound.com. They actually have a good video uh, showcasing the comets of January, which is really cool that they're starting to do that. Um, but this big one right here, 12P Ponds Brooks, this is the one that we're kind of hanging out um, watching because supposedly this is supposed to be visible during totality during the solar eclipse, that 12P Ponds Brooks comet. So that could be really, really interesting to see or photograph during totality if it's bright enough. So that's the one we want to keep an eye on for the eclipse. Um because we might actually be able to see it during totality, which would be awesome. Uh, so you definitely want to check that out. But there's also a cool set of other comets down there. And the way I like this website is they break it down by each comet that tells you the position and where it's at. Um, so you can see right here, 12P Ponds Brooks up in Cygnus. And it's at magnitude 7.8, so it's not naked eye visible. It's a telescopic uh, target. Um, but that one's good to go here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, this other one, 62P, uh, that one appears to be a pretty good one, 8.6 magnitude. So again, it's not too dim. So, And then there's a, another, it'll go down with each comet that's currently up and probably within decent range um, as far as brightness goes. And 
you can go in and check that out. So we're talking about the CQ350 again. So since you're back, uh, the CQ350 does not mate to the EQ6 tripod. It, it doesn't. And you could probably get some kind of custom adapter made, but it's not something that we are going to make because the tripod is too small to maximize the 75 pound payload that the CQ350 is intended for. Also, the base plate of a CQ350 is about eight inches wide. Um, actually, there's a CQ350 right here behind me and it just doesn't work on a tripod. It's, it's too small. So if you want to do that, you can buy the head and figure out a way to mount it for your needs. But Skywatcher will not make it a kit because it's, it's too small. It just doesn't work with it. So um, you need the bigger tripod. So hopefully that helps. But that's pretty much it for comments. There's some cool stuff up there. I'll, there's nothing naked eye right now. Um, unless we have like an outburst that really cranks up the magnitude on 12P Ponds Brooks. Because um, right now it's sitting at just under 8. Um, there's just not a lot going on in the world of comets right now. But there's some interesting stuff to watch. So we might get some cool stuff out of it. But there are some cool telescopic comets up right now. So if you got a comet, or I'm sorry, if you got a telescope for the holidays, go check it out. See if you can find some of them. All right, let's continue on. We might finish early today because we're going way faster than I thought we would. Uh, Deep Sky. Uh, Deep Sky, it's... The reason I like the winter is a lot of these objects are valid targets for months on end. Uh, so the first one, of course, is the Pleiades Cluster M45 and Taurus. Uh, this is a great object for any... Uh, experience of astronomer from the person who just got maybe their first set of binoculars or telescopes during the holidays you can go out in your backyard the Pleiades is nearly naked eye visible from any sky unless it's the worst of the worst but from an average backyard you could naked eye see the Pleiades without a problem it looks great in a small telescope looks great in a big telescope um, and it's a fun one to image in almost any focal length. So if you've got something basic like a star tracker and maybe a 200 millimeter lens, looks great. Got a bigger telescope, looks great. Um, there's all kinds of dust around this region. So there's no filter that really helps with a reflection nebula that is seen here with like the Pleiades cluster. Your best bet would honestly be to just go to a dark sky site if you have to use a filter excuse me if you have to use a filter you could use something like a an l pro or some average light pollution filter that'll just help knock down some of the light pollution and you could probably get away with one of the antlia tri or quad band filters um i don't know a lot about the quad band it's fairly new and from the specifications on the charts that they've posted, it really doesn't make any sense. Um, the tri-band I own, and several friends of mine own, and it's a fantastic filter. Um, it's my go-to filter for one-shot color imaging in town is the Antlia tri-band. Um, and that can be helpful because it passes a broader amount of blue. Uh, so that would help with maybe imaging in town uh, here uh, for like the Pleiades cluster or reflection nebulas. But other than that, you really just need dark skies for a reflection nebula. And that's all you can do. Do you have plans for an EQ7? Well, technically we do. It's right there. A CQ350 fits right between the EQ6 and the EQ8. So technically a CQ350 would be labeled an EQ7. But no, there are no plans for an EQ7. Um, because by our older naming conventions for mounts, you have the 5, the 6, and the 8. Um, the 7 would basically be what the CQ350 is, right in between the 6 and the 8. So we didn't call it an EQ7. I really don't know why. Um, we switched naming conventions, but the CQ350 right back here basically fits that. Um, fits that. So... We'll see what other cool stuff there is a few mounts in the works that I can't talk about yet. So as soon as I've got something to tell you guys about, we'll talk about it. 
Uh, but yeah, the Pleiades, going back to this, is an amazing target. Um, if you are just getting into it, you've got star trackers and DSLRs or mirrorless cameras. Um, those wide 200 millimeter lenses. And yeah, it's probably funny hearing that a 200 is a wide lens, but in the terms of astrophotography, 200 is a very short focal length uh, to use. There's all kinds of dust that you can get floating around the region of the Pleiades up in Taurus. Um, so definitely go in and check it out um, and give it a shot. But the Pleiades is a fantastic target, especially if you're brand new to the hobby and you just got your first tracker or your first uh, telescope for the holidays. Pleiades is a great target to go after and check out. Uh, next one's M15. Uh, this is up in Pegasus. Uh, this is still a pretty valid target, but we're getting into the end of the... I guess it is getting kind of low, but it's still a good one that you can catch. It's right not right there it's right over here somewhere but anyway m15 is right at the head of pegasus um so it's getting a little bit low um we'll lose it by the end of the the month but it sits right up here at the head of pegasus the flying horse that is m15 why the heck didn't it anyway that is m15 so um just off the head of pegasus there but that's a good one to go for, but it's it's a fun one if you've just got your first telescope um, again no filters you really don't need any filters for globular clusters they're actually very easy targets to image from in town but give that a go as well uh, if you're in darker skies you can get some of this uh, cirrus uh, celestial cirrus which is um, integrated flux nebula or IFN um, is what this nebulosity is called in there um, from dark skies, you can get some good stuff in there. This is a one-shot color camera, too. There is no luminance on this frame. So the IFN nebula that is in and present in this frame should be pretty doable if you're just going out for a night shooting M15. But right now, M15 is at the very end of its uh, presence in the, the evening sky. Andromeda, another one that's a fun one to get up there, M31. This one's the easiest of the galaxies to get. Um, very easy to image in town. Looks good in dark sky sites. Um, you can catch it from in town. You're only going to get the core of the galaxy, the central part. You might get M32 and M110. It's two companion galaxies there. Um, but it doesn't need anything crazy. Uh, but if you do get to dark sky sites, binoculars are a phenomenal view of Andromeda because you just get the presence of how big and extended uh, this target actually is and it's monster um, one of the best views I've ever had is in 10 by 50 binoculars um, from a dark sky site for Andromeda so it's a fantastic object to actually go after um, and you don't need any crazy aperture to do it um, actually the larger the telescope gets the less of the galaxy you can see because it goes beyond the field of view you will get more structure and kind of the cloud bands and the core and stuff like that, but you won't get the extensions uh, too much because it just the field of view won't allow it. So you do need shorter focal lengths, but it looks good in all kinds of telescopes. A uh, more challenging target. This is primarily an imaging uh, target unless you have night vision. Um, sharpless 155. Um, sharpless targets. Um, Sometimes you can find them as listed as sharpless. Um, other ways, it would be SH2 dash, whatever the number is. So this would be SH2 dash 155 would be the way that probably shows up in some other catalogs. Um, but that the SH2 uh, designation is sharpless. Uh, so this is the cave nebula that's up in Cepheus. Uh, Cepheus is well placed right now, um, but we probably are getting to the end of its time. Yeah, it's going down right now, um, but it's still there. You can still get it for a couple hours, but a lot of the tar dusty targets of Cepheus are starting to go down um, and set. It's just going to get too low. If you're more further north, it's a circumpolar uh, constellation, which means it never goes below the horizon. But we are getting to the end of Cepheus. Cepheus is a weird one because it's one that we usually equate with winter, but it's actually kind of a late summer 
early fall constellation is when that constellation becomes valid to really start uh, digging into where it's high enough and you get long enough time inside of that uh, before it gets too low. So Cepheus is still hanging out there, um, but some of these you're going to probably have to wait a little bit. But the Cave Nebula is a cool one, very dynamic in hydrogen. You could do Hubble Pallet with this, uh, but it, it's very responsive to hydrogen, uh, and that's what we're seeing here. This is an H-alpha image. I think it's only like an hour's worth, but... Um, if you have an H-alpha filter, you can easily get into this target, even from your backyard. Um, if you just got some money and you want to shoot H-alpha, um, deep sky with like monochrome cameras, uh, I get the question a lot. And that was one of my first questions is what kind of band pass do I need for H-alpha? Because they're really all over the place right now. There's, you know, everything from... 12 nanometer which is really broad all the way down to I think two and a half now nanometer from like antlia um personally i think five nanometer well if we're talking h alpha six or seven i would pick something between five and seven nanometers i think five is the best overall option for hydrogen alpha it's narrow enough to really be useful anytime, but it's not so aggressive that it becomes a little harder to focus. Um, three nanometers, the contrast does go up, but you also have to pay attention to how fast your optical system is because it may clip. And then as you get narrower down to these 2.8, 2.5s that Antli is making right now, um, the contrast goes up even further, but I haven't played with one of those yet, uh, but if you're looking for an all-around, just really nice H-alpha filter, I would probably pick a five or six, maybe seven nanometer. I don't think I'd go any higher than eight. Um, I like them a little bit more on the narrow side for the contrast purposes, but not super narrow because there's not a lot of issue and infringement with H-alpha from like the moon and the city and stuff like that. So you can get away with a broader band uh h alpha so but i'd pick something in the middle five or six my favorite one is the astronomic six nanometer that's a really nice filter um they're not terribly spendy but they're really nice quality and they're thin the cells on those are really thin and they're awesome so really like those um of course you also have chroma chroma i consider to be the top filter manufacturer right now um, if you want the high dollar, high quality filters, and then you have Optolong and Antlia. Antlia, I do think is a bit higher on the list. Um, they also have a lot wider options as far as sizes and what you can get. Um, and then Optolongs are, are quite nice as well. But I would probably go Chroma, Chroma, Astronomic, Antlia, Optolong, and then you kind of go down to like ZWO filters that are kind of budget filters but um if you're looking for a good all-around filter to shoot stuff like this get yourself a hydrogen alpha filter monochrome camera pick yourself up a mon a h alpha filter somewhere between three and seven nanometer band pass but if you're looking for an all-around nice one five to seven now you can also do stuff like this. This is IC59 and 63, the ghost of Cassiopeia. We're getting towards the end of the season for this one as well, but it sits a little bit higher than Cepheus does right now. So you can still get some time on this. Um, but uh, ghost of Cassiopeia or the Gamma Cast Nebula is another uh, name for it. About 610 light years away. You can see this visually. Um, it's a bit of a challenge. The best view I've gotten of this was actually with a C14. Um, even my 28 inch daub, which does a really nice job, um, the 14 I think did better. Um, so, yeah. Let's see. Imaging. Uh, you can do one shot color on these. This does work really well with narrow band. Um, you can do bicolor images, which is H-alpha 03. That looks cool, too. Uh, there's not a lot of sulfur in this object right here, so you could probably do a Hubble palette with it if you really wanted to, but I'm not a big fan of S2 filters. I think they're a waste of money. Uh, that's my opinion on them. Go, go get yourself a really nice 03, like a 3 nanometer 03. Save the money. So, 
but it just depends on what you want to do. But that's the Ghost of Cassiopeia. Again, another one that you could do some really nice hydrogen work with. Uh, the Iris, I actually should have taken this one out because the Iris is getting down there. Um, you could probably still catch it, but we are done with the season uh, there as well. And it's just getting too far down. The Ghost right here is also another one. That's getting a little bit low. I should, probably should have clipped it from here. Um, M33, um, I've got some stuff that I'll, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Um, stuff I probably should have added. Imaging, imaging, let me pull up all my files here. One that if my hard drive would speed up a bit, so got spoiled having SSD drives. We're an HDD drive a little slow. Um, so the Witch Head Nebula, let me just, uh, this is a mosaic I've been working on for a little bit. Um, the I didn't get a, a chance to really do much with this so far because we're redoing our remote observatory setup a bit, which is where this was shot. Um, but the Witch Head right here is a fantastic object that you can go after. It's just next to uh, the bright star Rigel. It's a reflection nebula. And this is a very good time of the year to go after it. You can see it right here. Here's Rigel, and there's Rigel's here, and the Witch Head is right there. So it's um, Horsehead, Orion Nebula, uh, Rigel, and then just above Rigel is where the Witch Head is currently sitting. Um, but yeah, this is a mosaic that I'm working with. But the Witch Head is a great target to go after right now if you're looking for something that's a little bit more challenging. Um, and that's that's a good one to go after. Um, right now um, another one currently would be the rosette nebula now the rosette is a very large op or a very large target um, this is a bicolor image h alpha o3 image right here um, the rosette nebula sits right down here so just below not too far from betelgeuse in the constellation monoceros um, that's where, uh, the rosette is. And, uh, that's a great target to go after right now. Very heavy in the hydrogen. So if you've got those dual band or multi band, uh, filters for imaging, this is a good one to go after, uh, right now, but it's a very large target. So you either need a very short focal length optic to get the whole thing and a big chip, um, or you'll have to mosaic or you just do this and, shoot right in the middle of it and get what you can out of it um but that's a very cool one this is also a cool one if you have like a newtonian or an rc or something that's got subtraction spikes in it it just adds a little pop um to it because the bright stars will have those diffraction spikes some people hate them i like them so i think it adds a little flair to it um so there's some targets um then we have uh, M33, the Pinwheel Galaxy. Uh, this is a good one right now. It's not too far from M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, this one is worth adding some H-alpha into. Here's all the H2 regions uh, that are hiding inside the arms there. But that's the H2 uh, regions right there. And then you can add that in a little bit uh, there. So... Uh, Will Skywatcher make a bigger Apo triplet like the Ascar 185? I'm glad you asked that question. And since I didn't open up that can of worms, I will happily divulge into or dive into that uh, topic. Um, we have asked the factory and the engineering team to make an Esprit 150 and 200 for probably the last eight years. And it has not happened probably uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, they're very expensive. Uh, number two, they they don't sell well. Um, so here's the thing about the 185 Ascar that has just come out. Um, I'm a big fan of big telescopes. Um, I have a Stellar View 180. I've owned a Mead 178 ED. Um, so I've messed with 7-inch refractors before. And first off, I have no idea how Ascar is able to sell a 185 triplet for under $5,000. Now, I watch the chat on cloudy nights about these telescopes all the time. I have tried an Ascar 151. 
an FRA 600. Um, they have really nice machining, and their optics seem to be okay. Um, honestly, the ones that we've we've bench tested barely meet diffraction limited. Diffraction limited, for those who don't know, is 0.8 strel. Uh, 0.8 strel or one quarter wave is the bare minimum requirement for most companies to ship anything. Um, and that's what you have to do. Um, now the Ascar that I've seen and the 151 that I got a hold of barely met that spec, barely met that spec. Um, the, also the one that I've tried wasn't flat. Um, there's a lot of curvature on the edge. Now the 185, which I haven't had yet, uh, or haven't, I don't know anybody who has one right now cause they haven't shipped yet. I have some friends who are going to get them. Um, Here's what I will say as an owner of a 7-inch triplet refractor that I think a lot of people are not going to consider with the 185. Now, a 7-inch triplet is a big telescope. Um, it is much larger than even a 6-inch triplet. And a lot of us have gone to star parties and we've seen 6-inch refractors. There's the Celestron C6R. Um, there's the Explore Scientific 152 Carbon, there's the AR 152 from Explore Scientific, the Acromat. There's a lot of six inch refractors on the market. Many of us have seen a six inch refractor and they're fairly manageable. They're, they're decent sized telescopes, but they're fairly manageable. You could put it on like a C gem or an EQ 6 R visually and get away with it. Um, you could get up to something like a G 11 or something a little bit bigger if you want to do imaging with it. But most of the time, a six inch refractor is fairly easy to work with and you could probably find an affordable mount to make it work if you're on a budget. Um, like a CQ 350, like the one behind me, you could image with an Esprit 150 or an AP 160 or a Tech 160 or even the monster TOA 150 from Takahashi. You don't need a crazy mount to hold a six inch refractor. A seven inch refractor on the other hand is a bit bigger and it's longer. So you're going to need that moment arm. The mounts that you're going to need to hold the Ascar 185 are going to be bigger. And another issue with it is that a lot of mounts on the market are not tall enough to handle a refractor that long. Um, so you have this refractor that's big and bulky that is really good price. The price is phenomenal, but you are going to need a mount that's probably not too affordable to a lot of people who would be getting the 185. That's just going to be a physical limitation. I don't care if it's the Ascar 185, a Stellar View 180, an AP 175, a Tech 180, whatever. These are big refractors. So I think a lot of early adopters of the 185 are going to be surprised just how big this telescope actually is. Now, as far as the 185 and the other Ascar triplets, there's a good chance they're using FK61. FK61 is a CGGM Chinese made glass and the equivalent from Ohara is FPL51. Now, in Ohara's world, there's FPL51, there's FPL53, which everyone knows what FPL53 is. That's basically a fluorite, a synthetic fluorite equivalent. And then there's FPL 55, which is a newer glass, um, which is what the Stellar View uh, SVX 180 uses. It's just a li it's just a tad lower than 53, but the advantage is you can get it in bigger pieces and you can make these big refractors. Um, the Ascar 185 is using the cheaper glass, um, so. I'm really curious to see how its color correction is going to be because the images that I have seen so far are processed images. Um, they're not raw images. Um, I'm sure it performs just fine, but I'm really curious to see what a one-shot color, unedited one-shot color camera shows with a telescope that big when you're using that type of glass. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit of color fringing on it, which you could probably fix in Photoshop. Um, but yeah, I will be very curious to see how the Ascar 185 performs. Right now, Skywatcher, we don't have anything in the works that big. Um, 
And if we do, we're not going to, we would have to be using the high quality stuff like FCD 100 or FPL 55, ideally, if it's a triplet. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how the 185 is going to perform. I'm very curious. I'm eager to see if any of our friends, the reviewers like Nico or Trevor or any of them get a hold of one. Um, but I will be curious. Um, I know they make the 107. I know they make the 120 and even the 140. Those sizes you could probably get away with using a lesser quality glass. A 185 is a different animal completely. So physically and optically. So good luck. I'll be curious to see what you think. They have really nice machining. Um, I was impressed by the machining of what we saw on the ones that I got to see and play with optics, not so much. So anyway, that was probably a lot longer rant about the 185. And if we're going to make one my answer, right? Short answer is no, we don't have plans to make one right now. I'd love one, but if we do make one, it's not going to be that cheap. So let's see. Um, will there be new products announced this year? If so, will they be OTAs or mounts? Yeah, you're going to have to wait. So we'll announce it here. Uh, let's see. Um, continuing on with targets real quick. Uh, the Bubble Nebula, that's up there um, right now. It's in Cassiopeia, or not quite Cassiopeia. Um, it's hanging out, but it's getting kind of low as well. Um, yeah, it's. I'm kind of getting sidetracked at this point. Um, so that's another fun target to go after, but it's getting a little bit low. Um, of course, right now we have the M42 complex, um, horse head, um, all kinds of good stuff. Oh, you guys have all kinds of questions today. Let's see. Do you know any insider information about the Celestron announcement next week? Yes. And I can't tell you. So that's, that's the end of that conversation. So very heavy NDAs on that. So you'll just have to wait. So, um, Let's see. Uh, so this is the Orion. Con if you guys have any more equipment conversation, it's the first one of the year. Just throw it in there. We'll dive right into it. So perhaps Skywatcher can make a F4 Acromatic Star Travel 200. Talk about a kaleidoscope of a telescope. You know how much color would be on a two eight inch F4 refractor? be a kaleidoscope is what that would be so and you can get really cheap ones at like bed bath and beyond or amazon if you want something with that much color now an eight inch f6 acromat is doable so uh, you know what we're just gonna skip the <laughs> we're gonna just skip the targets at this point because um you guys know what these are horse head nebula is a good one um and yeah you can go out there um Actually, during the break, we shot a new horse head shot. Um, I'm just going to bring that up real quick. Here we go. So this is the latest horse head shot. Um, but if you're going to be shooting the horse head, make sure you give yourself some time. Like, give yourself a whole night to really dig in to the target and do some deep exposure. This is all one shot color, about eight hours of exposure. This is on a Stellar View 180 um, F7 triplet at native F7, uh, ZWO 6200. Um, but if you're going to go out there, really do some deep exposure. Dig into it. Give yourself some time because you've got the flame nebula. You've got the horse head. You've got all this really elegant dust in there. This is no luminance or anything. So all of you guys should be able to go out there and just kill it. Um, right now and the horse head is perfectly positioned right now to to get a whole night's worth of data on on this target so go out there whether you're from the backyard or you're shooting in a dark sky site or maybe team up with some friends have one shoot luminance and you shoot narrow band so um you can mix and match with stuff too uh, and of course you have m42 that's a that's an easy one to shoot right now as well um let's see thank you I, i'm really happy with that image too uh won't be able to see any color if it has a uhc filter mounted to it yeah so i think big acromat refractors like the i stars um or even the old dngs those are really cool telescopes and there's definitely a market for large acromat refractors 
And I understand they're primarily visual. They're also excellent for hydrogen, uh, for solar. Um, we're actually probably going to do an episode sometime later this year. Um, I have a six inch F5 Acromat, the Star Travel 150, and we're going to image with it. And we're going to see what kind of image we can actually build with an Acromat. Um, and I think we might be surprised. So we'll see what that goes. Um, but yeah, let's see. What do you need to see the horse head visually? Uh, visually, I'd probably say at least a 12 inch telescope, very dark skies and preferably an H beta filter um, to isolate the eight, the hydrogen beta line, which is primarily where the horse head emits, or at least IC 434, the reddish nebula around the horse head emits. And you're looking for the absence of light where the horse head actually sits. Um, but H beta is ideal uh, for that. But you can squeak by with a UHC filter because it does pass uh, UHC or it does pass hydrogen beta. So um, more aperture, the better, though. Seriously, more aperture, the better, the uh, easier it is to get the horse head. But it's also a lot larger than I think people it, uh, think it is. Um, and if you know someone who has a big daub and a night vision on it, it's a walk in the park. Uh, how do you deal with Alnatac? I point a telescope over to it and whatever shows up, shows up. Um, Alnatac can be really tricky though because it's super bright um, to deal with. Visually, I try to get Alnatac out of the field of view. I think that's one of the keys to seeing the horse head is you want to get Alnatac out of your field of view. Um, imaging wise, that's really hard to do because it's generally within the chip field. If it's a good telescope that's well baffled, Alnatac isn't a big deal. Um, a nice refractor and the good baffles that are generally inside some of these imaging refractors take care of it. Um, but you may get some halos if you're doing something like a Rasa or a Hyperstar. And that's one thing you want to make sure you've got some really good filters that don't have any halo effect because you'll get a nice halo sitting around Alnatac there, which I don't generally mind too much, but teach their own. Uh, let's see, going down the list, waiting for the Skywatcher pets of all. Yeah, me too. Um, any options? Oh, for the Crab Nebula? Uh, the Crab Nebula is not too challenging, actually. It is smaller, um, and it's not as easy in town as you would think it would be. It's better in a dark sky site. More aperture is always helpful. Add some magnification to it. Imaging, it's not terribly difficult. I have an image in here somewhere. Let me find an M1 shot. Final. So this is my M1. Um, this was on a our six inch Esprit from our remote spot and I did have to crop. Um, it is a small target, longer focal length helps um, for this. It is rather small, um, but that's the crab. Um, if you wanna get the tendrils, the secret there would be hydrogen alpha um, time. Uh, that really helps pop that out. You really wanna get that red, you know, those red tendrils, H alpha is really the way to go. You can see that visually with a very large telescope, like a 20 or 25, 28, 30 inch telescope um, and a UHC filter in really dark skies. You can see the tendrils um, that encompass M1. It's actually pretty cool to see visually. Uh, um, night vision with H alpha, easy and a big job. But Visually, it's not terribly challenging in any telescope from a dark sky site. It's just a little lackluster because there's not a lot visually to M1. Um, and then imaging longer focal length. But it's not terribly hard. It's just not this big. It's not like M42 or M13 or, you know, this big glorious nebula. It's just kind of a puff um, in the field of view. Cameras do better on it. But again, focal length to get that image scale up. Okay, um, let's see. Let's talk about Totem. So, target of the month. Um, 
here are the rules for target of the month. Nothing has changed um, for this. It must be an image done within the month. Um, all your entries need to go to totem, T-O-T-M, at skywatchusa.com. Um, you have to be in the U.S. or Canada. Um, I did get someone who sent in uh, a totem for this month already. Um, it was a great shot, but unfortunately, he's not in the, the region, and it wasn't shot with data within the time frame, so it, it doesn't fit there. So um, let's see. So name, equipment, image specifications, mailing address so we can ship you your patch, and the U.S. and Canada only, and a fit or raw file. And speaking of a patch, here's the new 2024 totem patch. Now, 2024 is also the 25th anniversary of Skywatcher. Um, I would stay tuned uh, for some announcements about our 25th anniversary and some maybe interesting products for that. Um, we'll be announcing those as soon as we can. Um, but this is the patch that will be shipped out for anybody who shot uh, Totem for January. Um, we don't have the patches in hand yet, but this is the, the digital design for it. And this is what you'll be receiving Um for 2024 uh for totem so this is the new patch so uh yeah so for 2023 oh wait let me skip this um this was the target this is the smoking dragon nebula lbn 762 um i'm sorry the drunken dragon nebula there's too many dragons on the sky apparently so I'm not sure when we turn into game of thrones but so um the Drunken Dragon Nebula LBN 762. I was really surprised how many of you got some pretty good stuff on this one, considering the difficulty level of it. Um, um, so you guys did some really nice stuff. We definitely appreciate this one. 300 Quattro. You don't see the 300 Ps too much. So Quattro 300. Uh, nice job. Um, so guys did some good stuff. This is very nice. Very smooth. Um, so good job. Um but you guys did some really good stuff to, uh, considering how difficult this target actually is. Uh, but good job to everyone who uh, took part in this one. So nice work. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I tuned in a bit late. But any thoughts on the big uh, seagull or Thor's helmet? And can't I always forget about Thor's helmet? Thor's helmet is a great target to go after this time of year. It's in Canis Major. Um, it's a little smaller than people think. It's very heavy in the O3. Um, so if you're imaging it with narrow band, oxygen three is going to be what you want, but it's a great target to go after this time of year. And I always forget about it. Every time I remember it, it's too late to go after it. But right now is a fantastic time to go image and view Thor's helmet's actually a lot easier visually than people think too, from a decent dark sky and a average telescope, like a, I don't know, like a 10 inch, um, and an O3 or a UHC, O3 works better, but the UHC is nice too. You can get some nice detail on that as well. Um, okay, so little announcement for Totem starting this year. We're gonna be doing the Totem contest. Now, all my imagers, I want you to pay very close attention um, to the details that we're actually about to provide and we'll make sure we get this up on the page. So the last couple of years that we've been doing target of the month, you got a patch. Um, a patch is basically thank you for being a part of Totem and every month you enter, you get a patch. Now we're gonna up the ante. So you get a patch. Every month you'll get a patch. However, out of each month, our team will pick the best image out of that month. Um, and at the end of the year, we will have 12 images, hopefully, unless there's some really good ones that we just can't but uh, at least there'll be 12 images at the end of the year for us to pick from. And that is when we're going to bring in our uh, collection of judges and we're putting them together as um, right now we're working on that. Um, there'll be really well-known imagers that they're not part of the sky watcher, you know, actual internal team. They're friends of ours. And we will provide them with the top images from Totem that have been collected throughout the year. And they will pick the three winners. And instead of giving you guys product, here's what you get. So the third, third place, you get a $500 credit 
Um, you can go to Skywatcher's website and use that $500 credit to apply to any purchase that you want through the Skywatcher website. That's third place. Second place, a $1,000 credit towards anything on the Skywatcher website. So that's what you get. First place, $3,000 in credit to where you can go on our website and buy anything that you like. And then the grand prize winner, the winner of the first place, the $3,000 credit, um, your image will be used for an ad probably in Sky and Telescope or whatever we choose to use it on. Um, but we'll use it as the backdrop for a ad and maybe we'll get a big printout and send it to you so you can actually have it um, on display. So that is uh, the totem contest that we hopefully be doing annually, but we're going to try it this year. So again, um, this will be done at the very end of the year. Probably next January is when we will actually pull the winners. Um, third place is $500 credit towards Skywatcher product on our website. $1,000 credit for second place. And first place is $3,000 in credit. And and your image goes on one of our ads. So uh, we will try to get all that information up on the totem page um, for you guys to check out. So starting now, good luck. So be curious to see what you guys can actually get. Now the January totem target, it's one of my favorites. This is Sharpless 308, also SH2-308, also called the Dolphin Head Nebula. This is in Canis Major. Um, this might be a little low um, for our Canadian friends, and if so, I apologize. But um, that's uh, I had to pick something. So this is what we're going after this month. Um, oh, a calendar. That's a good idea. Thanks, Steve. We might have to do a totem calendar. That's pretty cool. We'll talk to our marketing department about that. Um, but yeah, this is the sharpless target for January. Um, I'm sorry, the totem target for January. Um, so uh, good luck to everyone. And uh, that pretty much wraps up for the month. Um, so if you like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. Um, if you need to give us an idea for future episodes, let us know. Info at SkywatcherUSA.com. Title it What's Up. And that uh, pretty much wraps up everything for today. Now, next week, uh, we're talking Nina. Um, Sinscan and Nina. We just made the jump um, over to Nina lately. I'm still kind of learning it. But it's a pretty impressive uh, program. But I'm going to kind of run you through all the stuff I've had to learn and just kind of show you how to set up Nina for SynScan uh, control. So I'm just going to run you through the stuff that we've been using, ZWO cameras, um, fo basic focusers, but we'll try to go through and kind of show you guys how that all works. That's the reason the CQ350 has been back here because that's been my test setup. Um, but we'll be going over Nina uh, next week. Uh, but yeah, if you guys like what you see here, please leave a like, subscribe, let us know we're doing a good job. If you want to support the channel, let me bring this up. You can head over to skywatcher.threadless.com. You can pick up some cool shirts, some swag, um, and check that out over there. Um, we've got some cool stuff, and we're always adding new stuff. Sometimes stuff is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, you can head over there and support that and go from there. Um but yeah, thank you very much, guys. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Um, we hope you enjoy. I don't know why my camera's not obeying me. AI technology is fighting against us again, apparently. Uh, but thank you all for watching. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks for joining us in our first episode of 2024. Good questions out there. And uh, yeah, we'll be talking to you guys very, very soon. And we'll see you next week. So clear skies. Have a good weekend. Stay warm out there. And we'll see you guys next Friday. Take care. Bye.